Hello students, welcome to lecture 5 of our online course on nanophotonics, plasmonics and metamaterials. Today's lecture is on electromagnetic properties of material. In this lecture, we will see a quick recap of Maxwell's equation and then we will see the derivation of uh, wave equation and the boundary conditions. We will then introduce the electromagnetic properties of materials such as dielectric permittivity, magnetic permeability and conductivity. And then we will look into the classification of materials by anisotropy, by linearity, magnetization and conductivity. So, in this last lecture we have seen the Maxwell's equation can be written in these two forms, right? The integral form and the differential form. Also, we have seen that you know, in electrostatics or magnetostatics, the electric and magnetic fields are independent of each other, but in the dynamic or time varying nature, this electric and magnetic fields are getting coupled to each other. The first law that we have seen is basically the Gauss law. And the Gauss law tells us that the electric flux through any closed surface is equal to the charge enclosed by the surface. So, it actually describes the relationship between an electric charge and the electric field it produces. This is often pictured in terms of you know electric field lines originating from a positive charge and terminating on negative charges and it also indicates the direction of the electric field at each point in the space. The second equation is this one which is the Gauss law of magnetism. So, the magnetic field flux through any closed surface is basically zero and this is equivalent to the statement that uh, magnetic fields are continuous and they have no beginning or end. Any magnetic field line entering one surface enclosed by any magnetic field line entering the region enclosed by the surface must also leave the surface. It means that there is no magnetic monopole where the magnetic lines can terminate and that is why we say that you know, surface integral b dot ds is 0. The third law is the Faraday's law. Okay, Faraday's law. So, you can see the difference in the Faraday's law in electrostatics and in electrodynamics. So, there it says that a changing magnetic field induces an electromotive force EMF and hence an electric field. Uh, the direction of the EMF uh, opposes the change and that is why this negative sign comes into the picture and this is called Lenz law. So this is basically the whole thing is basically the Faraday's law of induction plus Lenz law electric field from a changing magnetic field. So, when you have the time derivative, it means the magnetic field is basically changing with time. So, it has field lines that can form closed loops without any beginning or end. And the last law is this one which is also known as Ampere-Maxwell law. So, here also you can see the difference between electrostatics and magnetostatics. So, the new terms which are sorry the electrostatics and electrodynamics and you can see the blue terms which are basically the difference between the static and the dynamic fields ok all these blue terms. So, we are just focusing here at this moment this is the integral equations the same thing can also be written in terms of the differential equations which you have described in the previous lecture. So, what you see here is that the magnetic field so, this is a magnetic field that is basically generated by either moving charges ok that is current or you know changing electric field d d t of you know displacement field is basically change in electric field. So, these two can actually give you magnetic field. So, this uh, fourth Maxwell equation this is the fourth Maxwell equation it actually encompasses the Ampere's law. So, only this part up to the I enclosure is basically the Ampere's law and this is the contribution to this law done by uh, James Maxwell and this is where 
he has got all this electric and magnetic fields you now coupled to each other. So this adds this magnetic field term which is coming from changing the electric field lines. So D is nothing but the displacement field, electric displacement field. When you say D D T, it means time rate of change means it's a, it's a time varying field and that can also give you magnetic field. Okay. So with that, let us look into how the wave equation is derived. So we understood that you know the electric and magnetic field gets coupled to each other and they can propagate through any region as electromagnetic wave. So it can be described by wave equation. Now the electromagnetic wave equation is basically a second order partial differential equation that describes the propagation of electromagnetic waves through a medium or in vacuum. Now how to derive it we will see. So this is how the electric and magnetic fields in an electromagnetic wave, the wave is propagating along this x direction and you can see the electric and magnetic field they are basically oscillating along uh, electric field is along y and magnetic field is oscillating along z direction here okay so the, this is also another uh, diagram that tells you that you know a current has got a magnetic field you know involved around it magnetic fields generated that also generates you know electric field and so on so this is how the electric and magnetic field lines are getting coupled and the electromagnetic wave is basically propagating in this particular direction. So you can see the homogeneous form of the equation it is written as del square E RT is nothing but 1 over V square times the second derivative of the electric field with respect to time. Now our goal is here to determine how the wave equation is basically derived from Maxwell's equation. Okay, So to start with let us look into this vector identity that curl of a vector okay is nothing but the gradient of the divergence of the, that vector minus the laplacian of the vector now with that we can always say that the gradient of a vector okay in case there is no you know it's a source free region means there is no current or charge in that region so we can take the divergence to be zero okay so this particular Karloff Karloff vector will be simply minus the Laplacian of that vector and Laplacian operator we have seen in the previous lecture okay so you can also you can write this for both magnetic field and electric field okay so the equation for electric field looks like this Karloff Karloff E equals minus del square E now in the Maxwell's equation do we have this particular term Karloff E yes we do so curl of E is nothing but minus dou B dot T. If you write B equals mu H, you can write minus mu dou H dot T. Okay. And then let us take curl on both sides. So you have curl of curl of E, that is this left hand side you are able to get from here. And on the right side also you do the curl. So you have curl of H coming here. Now what next? You already know one identity for curl of H. So curl of H can be given by dot D dot T plus J. So in the equation, if you go back, so curl of curl of E can be written as minus del square E. So let's put it there. So the left hand side becomes minus del square E, and the right side has got minus mu D D T curl of H. Curl of H you can substitute from here. So that is dot D by dot T plus J. Now what is J? J is basically the current density. And we have assumed that it's a source free region. So the current density term can go to zero. So this term goes to zero. You simply have minus mu dot dot T of dot D dot T. And D can be written as epsilon E. So once you do that, you have basically minus del square E equals minus mu epsilon dou square e dot t square minus term you cancel out from both sides so you simply get this as your vector wave equation here e is a vector so you can think of the wave equation uh, three uh, you know scalar wave equation in x y and z direction now uh, 
it is evident from the wave equation that you know the connection between the electromagnetic optics and wave optics we have seen that the wave equation is basically obtained um, from electromagnetic theory only so we can say that you know the speed of electromagnetic wave is hence related to the electromagnetic constants mu and epsilon so let us look into the speed of electromagnetic wave so this is what we have got okay from the previous one yeah you have got del square e equals mu epsilon dot d dot square e dot e square second derivative here also you can write the same thing just that when we assume the light is in vacuum we take uh, mu r as the permeability and mu naught is the vacuum permeability and if there is a medium we incorporate that medium also here that medium relative permittivity epsilon r is the relative permittivity that is you know also included so this term is equivalent to 1 over v square so if you equate these two things you can simply write v square equals 1 over mu naught epsilon naught times 1 over epsilon r and this 1 over mu naught epsilon naught that is basically c naught square c naught is the speed of light in vacuum okay and final relationship becomes v square equals c naught square over epsilon r so i think all of you know this uh, constants mu naught and epsilon naught in vacuum and that also gives you c naught that is basically the speed of light in vacuum and that comes close to 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second now let's look into boundary conditions now at the interface of two medium of different um, optical properties the optical field components must satisfy certain boundary conditions and these boundary conditions become very important because they will tell us about the behavior of electromagnetic fields such as electric field electric displacement field magnetic field at the interface of the two materials okay now let us first consider the case when there is no source in the interface okay so now let us look into the boundary conditions so at the interface of two medium of different optical properties the optical field components must satisfy certain boundary conditions so as you can see this is medium one and this is medium two okay and this is the normal vector showing the normal of this interface so these are the normal components of the uh, b and d fields which is basically the magnetic flux density and electric flux density and these are basically the tangential components of electric field at region 1 and region 2 or you can say medium 1 and medium 2 here it is showing the tangential component of the magnetic field in medium 1 and medium 2 so these conditions are basically derived from maxwell's equation from the curl equations so these are the two curl equations we have seen them a couple of times so here from here we can say that tangential component of the field at the boundaries must satisfy so you can actually calculate n cap which is nothing but you know the vector marking the normal to the interface cross with e1 okay so you have a cross product okay and that should be equal to n cap cross product with e2 similarly you know n cap cross product with h1 should be equal to n cap cross product with h2 in simple words you can say that the you know tangential magnetic fields so you can also say h t1 should be equals to h t2 e t1 should be equal to e t2 okay and if you look into the divergence equation okay one important thing that here no surface charge okay so it's a charge free region okay the conditions will slightly modify when there is some surface charge we will see uh, in the subsequent slides so here you can see that there is, these are basically uh, charge free region and from the di divergence equation you can write that n because 
they are in the same direction you can write and cap dot you know d1 should be equal to and cap dot d2 it means the normal component of the electric displacement field should be continuous similarly the normal component of the magnetic flux density should also be continuous so this is what is the summary of the boundary conditions that you can derive from Maxwell's equation okay um, when there is no surface charge now in the presence of you know surface charge or any current density the boundary conditions will slightly modify and the concept of surface charge density will have you know practical usefulness so here let us see how it can be obtained so it is convenient in particular mathematically to define region where magnetic and electric fields are zero so let's assume in this particular figure there is a plane you know boundary surface so this is the boundary surface this is exactly at z equals zero separating region one and region two okay and we can derive the boundary conditions for h by you know using a small pill box which is having a height of uh, delta z so here you see in region one it is delta z by two so in the other side of this particular boundary it is this pill box is also having a height of delta z by 2 so overall the height is delta z and we will see that that delta z can go to zero so the media that is occupying such region are called perfect conductors and uh, these are idealization for any media where the fields inside are vanishingly small in conductors the field will lie on the surface so inside there will be no field so we can assume that you know the all fields in region 2 are basically 0 so e2 equals h2 equals b2 equals d2 all can be taken as 0 so now the electric charges and the currents are primarily located on the thin layer on the surface of the perfect conductors thus on the surface of the conductors we can assume that you know rho is basically infinite content in a zero thickness okay because we will make this thickness to be almost zero so your charge density can go to infinite so if that is the case you can also write that surface charge density rho s can be defined as under the limit when z tends to zero it is basically rho times delta z and the unit will be coulomb per meter square so we have seen here our assumption tells us that there is nothing in the second layer region so d2 is 0 so we can write you know that n cap d1 is rho s okay that is the charge towards the region 1 okay so this is the difference that you see in the presence of a surface charge density so here the difference in d components normal to the boundary surface is basically equal to the surface charge density at the boundary surface so here like uh, the normal components of displacement field are not same there is a difference and the difference is basically the surface charge density similarly when you assume that you know the surface current density along x and y are infinite okay to create a surface charge density js when you know the delta z the thickness of this pill box goes to zero so again you can write js is basically under the limit of z tending to zero j delta z and that tells you that the tangential component of the magnetic field in region one that is n cap cross product with h1 is basically js whereas h2 in the region 2 it is basically zero so there is a difference between the tangential component of the magnetic field in region 1 and region 2 and that the difference is given by this surface current density okay so in um, in a tabular form if i want to show this you can see this uh, column shows the vector form and this writes the uh, scalar form of the same equation so as you can see the difference in the tangential components of the electric field along the interface is zero however the difference in the normal component of the displacement field 
is equal to the surface charge density rho s and you can also see the difference in the tangential component of the magnetic field is j s that is the surface current density however the normal components of the b that is the magnetic flux density is also continuous so you can simply remember this uh, equations that when there is surface current density or surface charge density only these two factors are getting disturbed okay so this will be the boundary conditions in that case okay so the normal component of the electric displacement field will be altered and the tangential component of the magnetic field will be altered so with that let us now uh, move ahead and discuss about um, the electromagnetic properties of material so why we need that because when any material interacts with an electromagnetic field there are certain parameters in that material that quantifies that interaction and that can be given as the constitutive relations okay like when the field actually interacts with any material there are a couple of fundamental parameters one is uh, electric permittivity that is uh, epsilon then you have magnetic permeability that is mu and then there is electric conductivity sigma these are the three parameters that more or less you know quantifies the interaction of any material with an electromagnetic wave so if you look into the constitutive relations the first one is basically describing the electric response so by electric response i would like to uh, mean here is that the permittivity is basically giving you the relationship between the electric field the applied electric field and the displacement field okay that is being generated so it also tells you how much is the uh, polarization the material is going to experience under the influence of this applied electric field similarly magnetic response is characterized by the permeability so here also it tells you that what will be the magnetic flux density in the presence of a magnetic field given by h okay the last one so this one is also known as ohm's law where j equals sigma e so it tells you that you know when in the presence of a applied electric field how much will be the current density in that particular material so that actually tells you about the electrical conductivity in that material so sigma stands for this conductivity okay so it describes how much this material is able to conduct electricity now let us slightly go into the details we have seen this couple of times but just that you know to give you a quick, a quick recap uh, permittivity epsilon is basically the ratio of the displacement field over the applied electric field right and it tells us that you know how much interaction an electric field has with the medium it resides in so this is a particular diagram i have shown this before as well so this is for a unpolarized uh, material where you can see all the you know atoms and the electron clouds are in the same place so when there is no electric field there is no polarization there is no displacement field as well as soon as there is an applied electric field okay this electric field will try to push the electron cloud away so the nucleus and the electron cloud will get slightly you know separated so that will create the polarization okay so you can see the polarization is basically can be given is proportional to the applied electric field of course and it can be given as epsilon minus epsilon naught times e okay so overall you can find out the displacement field d equals epsilon naught e plus p i think it's given here yeah so the displacement field or electric displacement can be written as epsilon naught e plus p and if you take this equation for p you will get d equals epsilon e so epsilon naught is basically the vacuum permittivity but epsilon is basically the permittivity of this material okay now we will define the constitutive relationships for linear homogeneous and isotropic media so whenever i say linear media 
it means the properties of the material do not depend on the strength of the field and something like here that you know polarization p is basically linearly proportional to the electric field applied so p equals epsilon naught chi e what is chi chi is a scalar constant it is called also electric susceptibility so when you write the equation of electric displacement field d equals epsilon naught e plus p you can also write it as epsilon naught p can be written as epsilon naught chi e and you take epsilon naught e common you will see 1 plus chi and this 1 plus chi is nothing but your epsilon r that is the relative permittivity so simply you can say relative permittivity is nothing but 1 plus the susceptibility and all other parameters are already known epsilon naught that is vacuum permittivity is known to you it's 8.85 into 10 to power minus 12 f by m farad per meter okay now inside a material medium the permittivity is determined by its electrical properties okay and permeability is determined by the magnetic properties okay so whenever you say permeability that is mu it is basically a measure of how well a medium stores magnetic energy so when exposed to an applied magnetic field the collection of individual magnetic dipole moments within most materials will attempt to reorient themselves along the direction of that field now this reorientation will uh, induce magnetization which contribute towards the net magnetic flux inside the material and the degree to which this induced magnetism impacts the magnetic flux density depends on the ma ma materials magnetic permeability so we'll see that soon that uh, magnetic permeability is also defined as the ratio of the magnetic flux density within the material and the applied magnetic field provided that you know both the fields are sufficiently weak and we are talking in terms of a non-magnetic material here okay so if you take this uh, m equals zero okay so you will get b equals mu h fine so this is a generic formula you can write b equals mu not h plus mu not m but usually we in optical field we talk about materials which do not contain magnetic properties so you can take magnetization as one or zero you can remove this okay rather mu r is basically one so you can remove this and you can simply write b equals mu h okay what is mu mu is the perme permeability of the free space and that is given by 4 pi 10 to the power minus 7 henry per meter and the third one uh, we have seen that is conductivity so conductivity describes the degree to which a material can conduct electricity and uh, what happens when a electric field is applied to a material the free charges which are inside these are not bound charges the free charges inside the material they will uh, experience an electric force that is basically the coulomb force and this force will cause the free charge to move through the material in the direction of the applied you know uh, electric field so electric field is applied in this direction so all the positive charges will move towards from left to right whereas you know the electrons will move on the other side so the ease at which an electric current or uh, electrical charges uh, can move through a material under the influence of an electric field that depends on the materials electrical conductivity so if you denote this by sigma electrical conductivity it is basically the ratio of sigma equals j equals sigma e so what is sigma sigma is basically j over e that is the current density over the applied electric field if you take that ratio you will get electrical conductivity and inverse of uh, sigma is also known as resistivity so sigma can be written as 1 over rho and the unit is ohm meter now let us try to find out the velocity of electromagnetic waves to do that we can go back and revisit the wave equation so this was the wave equation we derived okay and in this two format if you equate this two format you will see that 
this particular term mu naught epsilon naught epsilon r is basically equal to 1 over v square so from that you can find out what is v square v square is c naught square over epsilon r now why i am actually showing this slide again because this slide actually gives you a very important parameter in optics and photonics domain which is called the refractive index of material so if you take the square root on both sides you will get v equals c naught over square root of epsilon r okay and you will see that that is basically nothing but square root of epsilon r is nothing but n that is the refractive index of the material in other words you can say n is basically c over v okay so from that you can also define refractive index as a ratio of the speed of light in vacuum over the speed of light in that particular medium which has got the refractive index of n what are the other relationship n equals square root of epsilon r you can write epsilon r as 1 plus chi so you can write n equals square root of 1 plus chi so refractive index is a very very important optical property of any material and it is defined as the ratio of the speed of light in vacuum over the speed of light in that particular medium so now let us do a quick classification of materials by its anisotropy so first if we see if any material is isotropic it means the properties of that material does not depend on direction of the fields something like the we can write it like this d equals epsilon e b equals mu h j equals sigma e so they are not epsilon mu and sigma are not dependent on the direction of the field they are scalar quantity so these are isotropic and here you can simply mean that because they are not having any direction so e field and d field they are parallel h and b will be parallel e and j will be also parallel so that is isotropic case now coming to the anisotropic case obviously it means that the properties here epsilon mu and sigma depend on the direction of the fields okay it means you cannot you can no longer say that e is parallel to d or h is parallel to b and so on you have to compute whatever is the actual direction for each of these fields fine so in that case uh, when a material becomes electrically anisotropic it has to be described by a tensor and we call this as permeability tensor and it will also have a scalar permeability whereas when a medium becomes magnetically anisotropic it is described by a permeability tensor that is this one and it will have a scalar permittivity so let's these are like a different or notation of writing the same thing permittivity tensor can be written as this can be the tensor notation okay so this is how you know in anisotropic media the constitutive relationships look like so d vector e vector and then this is a tensor Perme this is permittivity tensor and this is permeability tensor now the properties are dependent on the so the properties are independent of the direction of the field okay and the crystals are described in general by symmetric permittivity tensors there always exists a coordinate transformation that would like to transform a symmetric matrix to a diagonal matrix and in this coordinate system called the principal axis the permittivity tensor will typically look like this so this becomes a diagonal matrix from a symmetric matrix you can get a diagonal matrix by doing some coordinate transformation so here you can see there is epsilon x epsilon y and epsilon z it means there is a permittivity along x direction a different one along y direction and different one along z direction so three direction okay you have three different permittivity so this is how the principal axis for any anisotropic medium will look like so this is how the permittivity tensor looks like it's a diagonal one so it has only all non-diagonal elements are zero so this helps in doing the computations okay and if you take example of a cubic crystal 
where x, y and z are all equal, then this tensor also becomes isotropic. But in the case of other crystal types, something like tetragonal, hexagonal, rhombohedral, two of the three parameters are equal. Say any two, let's assume that epsilon x and epsilon y are equal. Okay. So this kind of crystals are called uniaxial crystal. Okay. For the case of uniaxial crystal, the permittivity tensor can be written as this. So you have the tensor where epsilon x and epsilon y are equal. So you can simply write them using epsilon and this is a different epsilon z is different. So it means that along x and y they have the same uh, permittivity but along z they have a different one. So you can take z as the optic axis and you can call this particular crystal a positive uniaxial crystal if the permittivity along z is larger than the permittivity along x and y and you can call it negative uniaxial if it is other way that epsilon z is less than epsilon. So as such you can actually think of an index ellipsoid kind of uh, situation where epsilon x, epsilon y and epsilon z are basically giving you a ellipsoid. So when epsilon x and epsilon y are same that means the cross section is same. So this is becoming a, a circle and then on top you can think of you uh, know this is epsilon z okay. So if epsilon z is larger than this one then it is called positive uniaxial. If epsilon z is smaller than epsilon it is negative uniaxial crystal. Now there are other types of crystal as well which are called biaxial crystals something like orthorhombic, monoclinic and triclinic where all three crystallographic axes are unequal. In that case epsilon x, epsilon y and epsilon z all are different and this kind of medium is also called biaxial medium. Okay, understood? So now we can also classify materials by linearity. So when you say linearity it means the property of the material does not depend on the strength of the field. So we can take like electric polarization which is P and that is linearly proportional to the electric field E. So P can be given as epsilon naught E plus epsilon naught, oh there is no, okay P equals, uh, th there is a mistake in the equation, P equals only epsilon naught chi E, okay this term is not there, okay. So this is called, this chi is the electric susceptibility, susceptibility okay. So from that we can, we have seen this equation couple of times, the D equals epsilon naught E plus P. So when you put P, P is only this term, not this term. This one you simply cross, I will just uh, cut it here. This term is not there, okay. So you can simply take P equals epsilon naught chi E, this is the typo. So when you put it back here, you get epsilon naught 1 plus chi common times E. So you can write D equals epsilon naught epsilon naught E. So this is for the linear materials. Now obviously in non-linear materials the property depends on the intensity of the field. That means in non-linear medium the electromagnetic response can often be described by expressing the polarization as a power series of the field strength E. That is you can write the polarization in terms of chi 1 E t chi square E square plus chi cube E cube and so on. You can look for other higher order terms as well. Okay, so here it was only the first order but here you can see you have got second order, third order and all other orders possible. So the chi square and chi cube these are called the second and third order nonlinear optical susceptibilities respectively. Okay, so there are materials which show this nonlinear susceptibilities as well. Now materials can be also be classified by magnetization properties. So we can have magnetic properties where you know the constituent relationship becomes B equals mu h. Okay. Now a magnetic material can be of uh, roughly three types. One is diamagnetic that is when the permeability mu is less than mu naught that is the relative permeability is less than one. For example, bismuth, copper, zinc, etc. So, in this kind of material, diamagnetic material, 
okay it is caused by the induced magnetic moments they tend to you know oppose the externally applied magnetic field so when a diamagnetic material is placed in a external magnetic field the external magnetic field is partly repelled and the magnetic flux density inside the material slightly reduces and that is how they reduce then the permeability in the surrounding or vacuum so that is how it is mu r is basically less than 1 so on the other hand there are paramagnetic materials so if you take you know uh, in that case paramagnetism is basically um, due to alignment of the magnetic moments so when a paramagnetic material such as platinum uh, chromium aluminum manganese these are placed in magnetic field they become slightly magnetized in the direction of the external field in that case you will have mu r that is the ratio of mu over mu naught greater than one you can also have material which are called ferromagnetic so if the relative permeability is not constant and it is very large such as in the case of iron cobalt nickel these are called ferromagnetic material and they do not have any constant relative permeability as the magnetization field increases the relative permeability also increases it reaches the maximum and then it decreases so further we can classify materials based on conductivity this we all know that uh, this is basically on the basis of the relative values of electrical conductivity or you can classify based on resistivity which is the reciprocal of conductivity so there are three types of materials or solid can be described as metals which have got very high uh, conductivity or very low resistivity you have semiconductors which have intermediate conductivity between metals and insulators and insulators are those which are having very high um, resistivity or very low conductivity so this is typically the scale of uh, the properties so for conductor semiconductor and insulator you can see resistivity is in the order of 10 to the power minus 8 to minus 6 ohm centimeter whereas in the case of insulator it is somewhere 10 to the power 7 to 10 to the power 18 is huge difference similarly the conductivity you see the conductivity for conductors are basically 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 8 mo per meter mo is basically the opposite of ohm mho okay and whereas in insulator it is 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 16 okay you can think of uh, the currents this in conductor it is mainly because of the free electrons in semiconductor you all know it is due to both electrons and holes whereas in insulator there is no current there is no band gap in conductors there is a band gap from 0 to 1 electron volt and uh, for insulators that that is for semiconductors and for insulators is mostly more than six electron volts okay and these are the examples of the common semiconductors conductors and insulators you all know okay so common insulators are wood plastic diamond mica and all this you have metals conductors and germanium silicon uh, gallium arsenide these are the common semiconductors okay so with that we'll stop here and in the next lecture we'll see the propagation of electromagnetic waves in dielectric medium and in case you have got any query as i mentioned before you can drop me email at this particular email address thank you mm -hmm.